What up guys? I have never made a YouTube video before, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a try. My name's Eric. I'm currently in what is a cold, rainy, and wet southern Utah in some business. I'm kind of bored in my hotel room. So I figured I'd do some stuff on MATLAB and uh, show you what I've done. So I originally got the idea from watching some videos of Matt Parker. He usually uses some weird way to solve for pi every pi day. And this particular year, I believe it was 2020, he took two 120 sided die, generated sets of random numbers, I think it was like up to 500, and he took the ratio of the prime and co-prime factors of each set of numbers and was able to generate pi off of that. I'll put a link to that video in the description, but I wanted to see what I could do with it, see if I could make improve on his Excel program and do a few visuals that he didn't do in his video. So I hope you enjoy. So the one thing I wanted to show you is the reason why this kind of works out. So I pulled up a Wikipedia page. It's just co-prime integers and it talks about what co-prime integers are and one of the uh, characteristics of co-prime integers is there's a probability of co-primality. And what that means is if you have two random sets of numbers, two numbers that are indeed randomly selected from some population of numbers, there is a probability that they will be co-prime and that probability is roughly 61%. So you have the product of all values of one minus one over p squared, and this is equal to one over two zeta, where zeta is the Riemann zeta function, and that is equal, you see where the pi comes from, that is equal to six over pi squared. So we can essentially just take pi, throw it out front, put a square root sign on and take six divided by our percentage, whatever percentage we get, and we'll get pi, or at least pretty close to pi. Here we are in MATLAB. The first thing I like to do is just clear everything, clear all our variables, clear the command window, and close all of the graphs that might be open when you run the program each time you make it or you rerun it then sometimes things are open and sometimes it doesn't like that things aren't cleared out so we're just starting from a blank slate each time so what I'm going to do is create a partitioned area to clear all and I'm going to say clear close excuse me close all and CLC, so I'm clearing the variables, closing all the windows, and clearing out the command line with the CLC. The first thing we need to do is develop some random numbers, and we can use the convenient RAND function from MATLAB. So, Some of the definitions that we need to make first though is we need to have a lower bound of the numbers that we want to select and that is just going to be one because we're selecting integers and the smallest integer is indeed one we want to put our semicolons on to suppress the command line we next need to have an upper bound so i'm going to say for now we can change this later on we can go one to one thousand after that I need to make some sort of array, some double, that is going to contain all my random numbers. And so if I, let's say, want to have a thousand numbers, I need a thousand rows. And I need two columns because I'm comparing two numbers. Each uh, set of numbers is going to be compared and then we can find the prime or co-prime factors and kind of develop a truth table that says yes these two numbers are prime or no these two numbers aren't prime and then sum up how many primes and not primes we have and hopefully get a ratio that is close to 60 percent. So the next thing I'm going to do is make some calculation
that is going to develop our random integers. And I can use the convenient rand function from MATLAB. I'll go through this step by step here. I can just say we need a random set of numbers that is a thousand uh, tall and two wide. So I can go rand rows, which is a thousand columns, which is two, so it'll pull from here and there, and that would develop all the rows and columns I need. Problem is, the RAND function natively, or by default, develops numbers that are only random from zero to one, so it's just essentially decimal points. So what we can do is we can say, that take the difference of the upper bound and the lower bound. So that would be 999. So we're multiplying the random number by 999. And we need to multiply there. And then add the lower bound. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've taken the random function, we can make a set of numbers from 0 to 1 that's just going to be decimal points. We can take those decimal points and multiply them by the difference in 1001, which is 999, and so we're going to get a bunch of values that are randomly from 0 excuse me, randomly from 1 to 999, and then we add that lower bound right here so we can get up to 1,000. And so next, these are still going to be have decimal points on them, so we need to round them up. So the last thing we need to do is add the round function in there. So now we're going to get a whole bunch of nice rounded decimal places and I can show you how that works real quick here. R is a 1000 by two double and we just get a bunch of random numbers between one and a thousand thanks to our handy equation. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is make a truth table that tells what the greatest common denominator is so we can figure out if they have any coprimes or not. And for right now, I'm just creating the truth, ta truth table and develop, later I'm going to develop a for loop for it here in just a minute. So what this line gave me is just a bunch of uh, essentially a thousand rows and two columns of zeros, completely separate from our previous random integer calculation. I can then take that table and put into a for loop to incrementally determine the prime and co-prime factors. So I can say for n equal to one through rows, which is a thousand. The GCD referring to this table that I just made from n for each incremental step of the for loop. 
through the first column equals, we're going to use the GCD function, so lowercase is the GCD function of MATLAB of R n comma 1 comma R n comma 2. So this is just comparing each row as it goes through of the first column and the second column to figure out if they're co-prime or prime. I'm going to say if the greatest common denominator for each row equals 1, And the greatest common denominator for the second column equals 1. And then you'll see why I did this here in just a second. Otherwise, that I put in an extra um, equal sign by accident. We're going to incrementally step up n each time it goes through the for loop with the n plus one there. And Let me do this right there. Okay. So what I said is I would populate the GCD table that we just made with all the zeros with a one if the GCD was indeed prime. Otherwise, it says it'll calculate it and then put a zero. And that way we can sum all these values up and determine the ratio of prime and coprime factors. So the next thing we need to do is find the prime ratio. And we can do that by counting the co-prime. So we're going to say the co-prime count is equal to the sum of our GCD table, 1 through 1,000, or whatever our rows are, of the second column. And we can say the probability or the ratio that we're going to come up with is the co-prime count, uh, our previous statement there, divided by the num total number of rows. So the total number of sets or pairs that we have, and that will create the ratio. The next thing we can do is estimate the value of pi. So the pi estimate is equal to the square root of 6 divided by the probability And the next thing I want to do is I want to know the error or how close we are to pi. So I can say the error from the actual value of pi is the actual value of pi minus our pi estimate from above divided by pi, and that's going to give us a decimal probability or a decimal percent 
So we are going to multiply it by 100 to give us a percent we can recognize. And the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make it look nice and print out the results. Oops, my bad. And for that, I'm going to use the fprintf function. So format spec one. I don't necessarily need to make it one or not. It would just re-update itself, but I like to keep those separate. The calculated value of pi is percent. We're going to say it's 4.8, which is the number of decimal places afterwards, the 8. And then we can return the carriage. We're going to say f print f format spec one. And for the number that we're using, we're going to say it is pi estimates. Excuse me, pi estimates. And the next thing I want to print is the error that we have. So format spec two equals this is the excuse me, this is a and then we're going to input our error number. I say we want four numbers, three decimal places, and format it, and then put our percentage sign out back. We have to do a double percent, otherwise it won't like it. Difference from the actual value of pi. And once again, return, remember to return the carriage when you are done, otherwise it won't look very nice. And f print f format spec two comma error. Okay. Let's see what we can do here. And it is not liking. That's what I did wrong. Okay, let's try it one more time. Much better. So we see down here, we get the calculated value of pi is 3.05, and we're 2.69% difference from the actual value of pi. Let's see if we can try to hone that in a little bit, make it a little bit closer. We can increase our upper bound so we can say we can choose from 100,000 numbers and 100,000. We can choose numbers between 1 and 100,000 and of those numbers we have 100,000 numbers to choose from. Now we can start to hone it in here. They'll take a little bit. All right, we get a much closer number, 3.1451. And that is a 0.113% difference from pi. And we can see that our error or our percentage is pretty close there. So I just want to give you guys a cool little thing you can do with MATLAB and I hope you enjoyed it.